Uh, much has been said, so there is very little to be said. But uh, I will say some of the things that in such a conference ought to be said. Well, whenever one goes to these conferences, uh, you have these titles, policy matters, evidence matters, implementation matters. Perhaps all of them matter equally. And, and one needs to think because uh, in the morning, in the previous session, Mr. Kumar had a wonderful question mark on implementation. So when you are evaluating a policy at some point, how much is it policy and how much is implementation is an issue. Good policy, bad implementation, or is it bad policy, good implementation? And how does one, and so we have the experts here to clarify this, they have done these extensive studies, one would like them to tell us how did they factor in implementation in coming up with this. I would just keep my comments brief, but it has to be said that the competitive advantage of nations now depends not on policy making. You go to WHO site and you will find everything on deworming, also on vitamin A supplements, and policies in fact can be googled and you can pretty much come to some kind of a policy, but try implementing. Nations which are making progress are the ones which are implementing. Uh, and implementation is the key determinant of the competitive advantage of nations. I think it has to be said. But having said that, um, it is also true that policy is an, is, a, is an experiment. Any public policy is an experiment. You sort of are experimenting. And then like any experiment, you collect information and improve your experiment. Much of the discovery in the world was done by multiple experimentation. So you can't say this is the final answer for a particular thing. You say this is, as of now, an experiment that maybe we can reduce child mortality through oral rehydration therapy or through deworming, many of the options, and then you see and go back. So I think one needs to also look into, do we have that feedback mechanism? Do we have in the government and, uh, and a sort of an attitude for experimentation, or is it just that if we stick to it, no matter what, just let's continue to do it, let's not admit that experiment has failed, and we continue for many, many decades, till there is an outcry or something, and the government changes, and let the other government then change. So I think this, so my last two thoughts on this is, uh, are, number one, when, when, when a policy is made, Mr. Kumar, and it was very telling, that they asked him to remove the evidence from the policy document. In fact, I would go that we as citizens have to demand that any policy that is made must include a section on, on what evidence it was based. If that section does not exist, we should not accept that policy. And sometimes when markets fail, this has to be done through regulation. And perhaps time has come, there should be a law that any policy should have, and you can say, there can be a blank page saying, we are making this policy, there is no evidence. But the problem is obvious, we need to solve it. So we'll collect evidence, but let's start working. Sometimes you have to make policies without evidence, because there is no evidence, you're solving a brand new problem. You can't say there is a tsunami and let's collect evidence what happens in other tsunamis. This is it, you have to solve it. So it's not that we should take this as a dogma that there has to be evidence sometimes, but there should be a recognition that we are making this policy without evidence. And that's okay too. But it should be a requirement that you leave a blank page saying there was no evidence, yet we have made this policy. Be brave enough to say that. And I think that's one. Second regulation that is required is there should be, and because there is a market failure, I am not for regulation. I am actually for free markets. But when free markets fail, you have to have regulation. The market has failed in evaluation business. There is no accountability. And Dr. Kera also sort of alluded to. So we have to have a regulation that there should be a mandatory, any policy must be evaluated, good, bad, or ugly, within three years or five years there should be. Because you know, most of the time we are evaluating when horses have left the stable. The secretaries have changed, ministers have changed, governments have changed, and we are doing a randomized control experiment for millions of dollars. I can predict that. You give me 100 rupees and I can say 
that if that policy will fail because there is no accountability. There was no ex ante requirement for evaluation. So if it has worked, it is by chance, not by design. So we need to be careful about that as well. So we need a regulation that each policy it should be by law, that it needs to be done and it should not be left to the whims and fancies of the policy makers that where they are succeeding, they will collect evidence to say we have succeeded. Where they are failing, they will just, you know, hide and get away from the policy. So this, these requirements are required in the public policy business if we have to have sound public policies moving forward. Free market will not deliver these things because the self-interest is not in this direction and we need to work in that. Having said that, we have the right people on the panel to answer these questions. Uh, they have been introduced. You have the introductions with you, so I will be brief. We'll go to Dr. Tharian directly and ask him uh, about the Cochrane study on deworming. That is the session. Uh, it's one of, you know, it's been all, because it's hard in these workshops and seminars to control topics. I mean, they just overlap, and so it is okay. Much, some of it has been commented by Dr. Khera himself, but we'd like to hear from you. In short, I think we have to make it like three, four minutes. Uh, it says 10 minutes. We'll have to make it short to stick to the time. So briefly, what was your study? What was your experience? I'm particularly interested more than government of India. Uh, what was your experience with WHO? Because again, the problem is many of these governments, and uh, with due respect, I was in the government, so I say it with love and affection and not with any malice. Uh, fact is, they are not capable to evaluate anything, especially developing countries. But WHO, that's why we say that we have created WHO, we paid money to them. They should think on our behalf and let us know whether deworming works or not. Once they have approved it, it's very hard for a developing country to sort of say, well, we, d we disagree with WHO, we are bigger experts than WHO. So I'd like to know what, what was the reaction of WHO in particular. Uh, as, so, as, well, as well as the government. Dr. Okay, uh, I do not know how many of you have actually read the Cochrane Review on deworming. Has anyone read the Cochrane Review on deworming? Some of you have, but in brief, uh, at the outset I must say I am not an author of that review. I have no vested interest in that particular process, except that as Cochrane South Asia, our job is to disseminate evidence which we think could make a difference to policy in our country. Additionally, we are funded by a program which is run through the Cochrane Infectious Diseases Group is a different funded program to try and use evidence to improve the lives of people in low and middle income countries. I got involved in this review, uh, in disseminating this review by the third update. So the first version came out in 2000, then in 2007, then in 2012. And one of the reasons I got involved in this review was Ajay Khera, because he actually asked us to come and explain this Cochrane review to him. Remember, Paul Garner and I came down to you. He had read the review, and he was concerned because it was diametrically opposite to what the government of India was doing. Now, the issue is uh, there are three ways we can try and get rid of worms using deworming as a strategy. One is uh, selective screening and treatment of children who are, at work, who are infected. A child has got worms, you've tested them, and you treat them, right? And that's one way. But the WHO reason, and probably makes sense, is that Testing is expensive. So the other option is to target school children and give it to them irrespective of whether they have worms or not. And that's our policy. And we can do it once, twice, or thrice a year, or even more times. And if another strategy which they talk about is mass deworming, where the whole community, including adults, get dewormed. This review is about looking at the effects of a selective deworming of children infected or community deworming of all school children. And they looked at trials from the first trial to now. And the current iteration, which came out in 2015, has 45 studies. And they, five of them are from India. One of those five studies from India randomized a million children, Devta, done in Lucknow. And the others together included, overall, uh, the, st uh, the studies included about 64,000 children. They were either given selective deworming as a single dose or as multiple doses, or they were given multiple doses without checking to see whether they have worms. And the overall evidence suggests that if you give uh, targeted, you know, selective deworming to a child known to be infected, it might have a little bit of an improvement in terms of weight, which can range from something around about a kilo or so. But it does nothing else. And 
and community deworming does not seem to show the purported benefits in terms of nutrition, cognitive functions, and all the other things that people claim they do. So that is the evidence. And when we discussed with Dr. Ajay Kera, he told us what the WHO's reaction was. He says, WHO discredits your review. And WHO says, this is it. And I think there's a briefing document which WHO has prepared to discredit the Cochrane review. Now, what I want you to know is that this review started a war. It's called the Worm Wars. There are two academic camps, very strongly entrenched positions. And the problem for us in, is how do we deconstruct all these arguments? So our job was to sit and look at what we should do. And I thought at that time, the 2012 review, that the problem is that contextualizing it to India is difficult because we do not know what our worm loads are, what the worm burden was. And I suggested that you should do a survey to see what are our actual worm loads. But the 2015 version of the review actually looks at, uh, stratifies all the studies according to prevalence, high prevalence, low prevalence, and you know, moderate prevalence, as well as intensity of infection, and still finds no evidence for it. So then what is the alternative? So I look for other evidence. What could work? There is a good systematic review which says that uh, improving sanitation, access to sanitation, and the use of sanitation brings down the infection rate for soil transmitted helmets. This is a good systematic review, 2012. And there is another systematic review looking at uh, whether you give increase the amount of deworming. So what they've looked at is comparing these school-based programs with mass deworming of whole districts. And they find those programs work. So your strategies are, do, how do we, you know, refine this? So one is to upscale so that everybody in India is dewormed which to me sounds like that's a big problem. That's one option. The other option is to consider how do we start looking much more carefully at improving access to sanitation and water. Because children get reinfected. Within a year, they're reinfected. So unless we can start looking at that, we'll be doing endless cycles of deworming and not achieving any benefit. And your problem, sir, is the same problem that all governments who are doing this have. We went to Nepal to see if we could help the Nepal government understand the use of evidence. They asked us to come. So the example I took was deworming, because they also routinely deworm. At the end of it, the policymakers gave me two questions. One, there are no studies in this review from Nepal. So how can we use this evidence? But the answer was very clear. The Devta study was done in Lucknow adjoining Nepal. There is no difference between what happens on that side of the border or this side of the border, because the worms don't know there's a border. It's the same place. So there clearly is evidence that investing so much money and time is not paying off the way we want it to. The second question he asked was, all that's true, but how do we withdraw an established program? Which I think is a big problem. How do you actually make the decision to withdraw it and justify that withdrawal? So I think that the answer is to actually see, we have to monitor what is happening every time we do this. You have to have a way in which you're saying we are looking at worm loads, we're looking at nutritional indicators, that's the thing. And what's going to happen is that's really going to change the way the government functions. Because these predictions you implement, but unless you can actually monitor what you've been implementing, you're probably wasting our money. And I know it's difficult. But I think you've already started setting up the systems. There are also two good systematic reviews which look at the prevalence of uh, worm infestation in, in India, 2016 and 17. They show that just looking at worm prevalence STH prevalence, people will be shocked if you withdraw the program because in some places there's 90% prevalence and some places there's 50% prevalence. So the question is how are we going to disengage from this saying there are certain areas even in my part of the world where in our hospitals none of the children have worms but in an adjoining tribal area lots of them have worms. So I think the, the, this is a thing that we need to debate. How do we actually move with this knowledge base to actually change our program that we are not doing it for everybody but for a few people. And Dr. Thalian, has anybody done a study on whether implementation makes a difference in the outcome? For instance, when I look at, and I'm not an expert on deworming, but because I had to be here, I Googled and I also became an expert, a Google expert. And it says that clearly there are thresholds. Beyond that, below that, it's not effective. So it says you have to figure out whether in your soil you have a threshold and then do it. Does government of India, and that's a question for Dr. Khera, there are various things and were those things followed and implemented as the plan was or 
then one could say, and was there any accountability? Was anybody held responsible? Or, you know, because otherwise uh, these outcomes are predictable and you're right. So I tell you, yeah. the very first directive that came out from the government of India, which was signed by Dr. Bond, said very specifically to the states, in states that have a burden of this much, 20% you do this, 50%, yeah. 20% don't do anything. Correct. But the problem is all states have just implemented it and only now are the systematic reviews saying where is the worm burden. Right. So I think it's really, really important for us to have this ground level data. This is a policy. I'll give another example of the use of evidence. The government of Ghana rejected WHO uh, you know, directive that we should use artisanate instead of quinine for treating falciparum and malaria because they said our data shows quinine works. We can tell you the number of deaths we are averting. Artisanate may be better, but we can't afford artisanate. We don't have it. We can't control it. So they may use an evidence-informed decision. Similarly, I think we should not view this Cochrane review as an embarrassment or anything of that sort of saying, but it's telling us, let's just start evaluating what we are doing. Dr. White, what did you find which was different and additional? Because yours is a more recent study, and how are the answers to the questions already raised? Okay, thank you. So Campbell also has done a review of deworming. Uh, fewer people have read that, I imagine. Um, we did a, the, the review, despite the Cochrane review, for three main reasons. The first was to do an update, because our review has just come out uh, very recently. The second was because, despite the Cochrane review, the worm wars were continuing. The Cochrane review hadn't settled it. Um, and our feeling, though the, the review would tell, was that we saw, and say, for example, here in India, the, um, the Deworm the World movement is selling de mass deworming as an evidence-based program and you'll find on various Indian websites for statement that global evidence shows mass deworming increased well-being, improves health and education, whereas the Cochrane Review shows that's simply not true. So we wanted to try and say, well, let's try and address this. The, the, the pro-dewormers had made a number of criticisms of the Cochrane Review and we identified 10 of those criticisms and tried to address each one of those, and I'll mention some of them, in the Campbell Review so we could have a more comprehensive analysis that responded to these criticisms. The, um, as we were in update, we had more studies. We had 65 studies in the Campbell Review, 12 of them from India, 10 of which are randomized controlled trials. The, the main headline of the Campbell Review is exactly the same as the Cochrane Review. There is no evidence to support the statement about deworming. It may be a small impact on nutrition, but there's no impact on, um, on educational health and, and, and so on. Um, the, there's some variation, some heterogeneity in these study findings. We tried to explain this heterogeneity. We did moderate analysis of various kinds and we could not explain it. So you do find effects in a num small number of African studies and particularly a study in Kenya has become very prominent in the Deworm the World movement in promoting deworming, but it's one study out of the 65 included studies. Um, there is an effect on haemoglobin in one study from South Africa, but that study included also iron supplementation with deworming. So it's not terribly surprising. It's not to attribute that to deworming. Um, but the other studies finding positive impact are in, in, in the Kenya, Uganda and Sierra Leone. And so we thought we'd be able to expand that variation, probably from base prevalence, no effect, as the Cochrane Review had also found. What the Campbell team are now doing is what's called individual patient data analysis, where you go back to the primary studies, get hold of the original data, replicate each study, and then pull all of those data so you have much more data available to examine heterogeneity. It's an enormous task, and I think they'll be finished next year is the, is the plan. Um, so anyway, so this is right. So, um, so one of the... Um, things that we looked at that would be a criticism of the Cochrane, Re Cochrane Review is the long run effects. So it's now by the performance of deworming saying, oh, but there are some studies that show, um, if you look at the long run, so deworming has been done for several years, you look some years later, you find increases, say, in, in employment or earnings in ch uh, children had higher levels of deworming. Um, there's, there's a new study of looking at the quality of these studies that says they're not particularly high quality, but the, we look at them in the Campbell Review and we do find out where they find effects. But my main point would be all of the long-run studies are based on the African studies. The African studies do find short-run effects. So it does not make sense to me 
to do as, for example, GiveWell, our US-based organization promoting evidence-based programs, including deworming, GiveWell extrapolate the, sh the long-run effects from the African studies to, for example, the Indian context or the Chinese context. In India and China, we have large trials, large trials that find no effect in the short term. So how would you expect an effect in the long term? It does, that doesn't seem to make sense to me. So um, what, uh, similar to, to, to uh, Pratap's approach, what I would say is we want to look at alternative interventions also that may have the same outcomes. And we do know from a number of reviews from Cochrane and from Campbell that improved, uh, improved um, sanitation and hygiene, access to and clean water are all things that have documented, well-proven improvements in child health. And if you improve these things, you do, you do see the improvements you expect to see. The problem we have in uh, improved water sanitation is uptake. So we know the point of use, water, improved, water, uh, improved water quality at point of use, improves child diarrhea, reduces child diarrhea by 30 to 40%, but you don't have sustained adoption of these technologies. We know that you can make latrines available, but you know, we know you don't have proper use, sustained proper use of those facilities. So the, the challenge for an uh, uh, initiative like Swatch Barrett is to say it's not enough just to supply toilets. You have to make sure there's proper use of these facilities, sustained proper use. Otherwise, you won't get ODF, open defecation-free communities, um, staying open defecation-free if they really ever become it. So I would end on the same note as Pratap, is that we're not saying, OK, just stop deworming. We've heard the challenge of closing programs, particularly when the apparent problem they're tackling, deworming, it worms, is, is, remains very high. What we would say is you do need to be evaluating these programs in the context in which you're you're implementing them against alternative programs to achieve the chain objectives and then push on rolling out the programs that prove most effective in achieving those objectives. Thank you very much. The only problem with that would be that, you know, in, and as you know very well, government is organized in silos. Dr. Kera is responsible for a particular area. I mean, he cannot necessarily, when and, you know, this is, again, a public policy issue and some regulation, some reform is required that how do you do when several agencies are required to achieve the same goal and it's not one agency, then what, what is that one agency can do? They do the best they can as far as they are concerned. So it's, I think it's a, uh, the lessons of this is that we need a, a reform of the public policy process rather than one intervention which may be we this way or need an independent evaluation of this. and you do need we that do you that. need need that and yeah. absolutely and th so I think that's the kind of uh, intervention dr. Keller before I pass on the as a lay person I understand again uh, not an expert that someone must have because these medicines are too dangerous to be they must have been FDA approved or someone must have approved to say that when you take this medicine the worms die someone must have said and only then we are giving to human beings I hope and when Someone must have said that when worms die, uh, you become healthy. I've seen uh, several cases in my short life that uh, that happens. Uh, children uh, are said to have worm and then they are dewormed and they seem better. So those must be two facts. So if you are doing that intervention with these two facts, how are the outcomes? Where does it go wrong? Because common sense says, Medicine works in deworming, unless you tell me that is in question, that's a separate study. Then you say that, well, when the worm, the huge worm, it's not like a one inch, I mean, these are, uh, these are meters or something. When they get out of your system, human beings feel better. So where does the failure occur, I'd like to know. I mean, how do these studies come up with that? Answer. And you're a doctor, so you will yeah, know. No, no, certainly, you know. You know, uh, let me share, you know, I mean, the overall genesis of the whole thing, you know, because uh, deworming is a kind of intervention which is there in the government of India's program for the last many, many years. And I remember when I took over as the in charge of the child health program, and there's an intervention which was happening, but then when I looked at its, you know, coverages, the coverages were very, very patchy. And somehow then in the question came to our mind, 
that whether it is a question of policy or it is a issue of implementation implementing a policy yeah. and the, the conclusion was the quick conclusion was that overall debarment is being implemented but in a very very patchy fashion coverage is range from 10 to 20 percent and so on and so forth so we thought that means there are problems in implementation so we you know shifted the gear from a issue of you know patchy implementation and we came up with a concept of you know national development day and we basically use the learning of the polio program when in a pulse polio program you know you can reach each and every child with the pulse polio drops why can't be a children be reached with the albendazole tablet which is a very well known proved as a doctor that if you give albendazole tablet there is a response so we converted this whole patchy program to address the issue of implementation into a national development day. and across the country you know we started this program right from 2015 and try and started giving this particular albendazole tablet right from one year to 19 years of age all the children so that was the kind of the science and simultaneously as a program manager we not only address the so called the coverages issues or implementation issues we also wanted you know some system to be in place where i can understand what is the baseline because somehow when we started the program i mean i do, did not have the adequate baseline so i said once we start the program we have to put some surveillance system in place and we call it a sth mapping right from the day we started this program we started the mapping of the whole country to find out what is the level of STH prevalence in the country? And now in the last two years of that survey, so called the evaluation, so basically the outcomes. And now I have a complete sense all over the country that what is the prevalence of STH in the country. There are states like Sikkim where we find 90% prevalence and which is supposed to be the most hygienic you know, state. I'm, I don't know I mean, how to explain that. But the fact on the ground is that we did that STH mapping and now I have a state specific information and across the country the prevalence is you know range from let's say 20 percent to 90 percent. States like you know Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, the arid region you know where the, the soil is you know very dry where we, we find the STH prevalence to be low. That's, good. That's, good baseline. That's the baseline and now it is not that because this is the STH surveillance system has been put in place. Now we are going to continue with this STH surveillance after every three years. It's a going to be a, a periodic assessment so that we can demonstrate that yes, after introducing this national development, we have been able to reduce the load. So, th so that's you know the kind of a, from a programmatic point of view, we have tried to put some system in place to get a sense of. But simultaneously, you know, we also got worried because after all anything which happens as a program it's a very cost intensive maybe as on today albendazole i am getting you know there's a who donation program and i get you know part of the donation but because my requirement in the country is around 400 million doses because i have children from 1 to 19 years of age 400 million children have to be reached so requirements are very very high so there is a cost is involved and also you know there is a time factor after the workers will go from house to house they get albendazole tablet program monitoring you know everything is you know linked with the cost so then you know we came to understand that there is a campbell and the cochrane review which demonstrated that all these mass strategies may not have a real outcome which is expected actually the expectations are that the children should gain weight the expectations are anemia level should improve, expectations are the educational status will improve and so on and so forth. But the studies demonstrated that it does not have, it indicates that it does not make a change. So we took this point to the maybe the WHO headquarters and the experts and raised this point because after all we are making investment and we want to know the answer. And then the answer given was that most of those studies which have been carried out where the meta-analysis has been done whether by Cochrane or by Campbell I mean they are all you know kind of a short term like in a two years time you don't expect a change 
you don't expect a weight gain. You need to have at least, you know, five to ten years long period to get an assessment and those studies are not there. So it is, you know, difficult to make an opinion with these studies that whether it has shown any impact or not. But, you know, we are very conscious of this point. Now we have put that surveillance system in place. We are tra and then another point is, you know, the so-called the safety part. Because as a clinician, we know that if child has a history of passing worms or the stool examination demonstrates so-called the ovum in the stool, we, as a, as a standard of clinical practice, we give albendazole. Now I know that if the prevalence is 50 to 90 percent in my community, you know, testing each and every child will be a nightmare. Because it is not only the, the science and the laboratory, it is even the feasibility of collecting a stool sample. So we as a public health program manager, we try to come out with some cost-effective approach, you know, instead of, you know, testing and, you know, treating. So let's give it a mass kind of a dewormin we can afford. And it's a cheap intervention and it is a safe intervention. Albendazole is absolutely a safe drug. So, you know, with that kind of a thought, you know, we thought of, you know, continuing the program, the program. But if we have, you know, better evidence, you know, we are always, you know, subject to change. It is not that some yes. intervention has been put in place and tomorrow we just, you know, take it away. Well, we will give you a chance to respond to this uh, WHO concern that this was a short term and not a long term. That's what the policy seems to be based right now. Uh, actually, uh, the um, long, there are long term studies as well which still don't show the benefit. Because uh, the Cochrane Review has excluded three studies because it didn't have certain things. But even the Campbell Review has looked at long-term studies. We're not finding that, unfortunately. I think it also could be that, no, Rajiv Sarkar from CMC did a cluster randomized trial which showed that in areas where there is some amount of infestation, about 30% or, you have to give four doses for it to actually deliver good results. So I think you might need to consider an evaluation where you say, okay, we've got the mechanism now to do this all over the country. What if we do a trial in real times? That we, in these areas, we increase the number of doses because I can send you the results of this. It says just giving one dose doesn't make a difference. Giving two doses, some effect, but if you give two doses followed by two doses six months later, one month apart, that brings down the worm density and actually does make something. Even then, the indicators on hemoglobin and weight and all are not that clear. But you can get rid of the worms. Because the problem is that mm. if you only have that strategy, it will continually go on forever until after you left the department because sanitation has to improve. One of the questions you asked is why is it that if a drug that kills worms is not showing the effects? There are two possible reasons. One is uh, over the years, sanitation has improved and worm loads are coming down worldwide. If you look at the Lucknow study, 10 million, uh, well, a million children, the worm prevalence intensity is pretty low compared to the African studies and earlier studies. So this secular trend is there all over. So I think if the government programs mesh yeah. and you have better sanitation facilities in those areas, you will find over the years that you will get rid of worms. But I still don't think you will get the health benefits that we all expect. I don't think worms are the cause of that. Well, <clears throat> you want to say something sure. quick? Yeah, just quickly. So, yeah, I, mean, I, so I agree with Sasha on that point. It says you have to think why it's not working and poor sanitation and over defecation are very, very likely reasons. Reinfection is just very common. Children get reinfected very quickly. Um, the, on the long run studies, and the ones that we look at in the Campbell Review, as I mentioned, are from the African evidence where they, they claim to show some effects. There has been a recent review by the team that did the Cochrane review questioning the quality of those studies, but even if the study findings are, are valid, then I point out again they are from the African evidence where there's no ev there's evidence of short-run effects, so maybe there are long-run effects, but in India there are 12 studies showing no effects, and what we would like to do here very much is see if it's possible to follow up the existing studies or to put in place long-run studies now, or basing on the point of using existing data, to see what can be done with existing data and various sources to do long-run analysis of deworming in the Indian context. And before it is done, Dr. Kera, it might be a good idea to have uh, Dr. White and Dr. Tharyan in the same room as WHO and thrash it out with everyone listening, so, so that we have the other side which is not represented be in the room to defend what they are 
not doing or doing. But here is a person who can really answer these questions. Dr. Nimbalkar does it on the ground. Uh, Dr. Nimbalkar, what are your uh, ex experiences in a practical sense, not in the terms of the studies and policies, but what do you observe? Thank you for the question, but uh, I would beg to defer that you cannot have answers on the ground without research on the ground. So it's not <laughs> correct to do that. Uh, but uh, I come from a village uh, and I work in a rural area in Gujarat and I got into deworming because of a project that we got uh, which looked at prevalence of worms and uh, how, how it does get reduced and whether m the microbiome in the intestine changes based upon the worm load. Uh, so we were looking at prevalence studies uh, in a peripheral area of Gujarat, in central Gujarat and we did all the testing etc. and unfortunately we did not get any worms and we found out that our, our worm testing protocol was bad. So the, it's, it tells you that it's difficult to get worms if your testing protocols are bad. So then we d retested the, uh, peop uh, the children and adults uh, recently uh, and we got around 20% uh, prevalence of uh, worms, uh, hookworms uh, in adults. So the worms were not there in children because the deworming day happened in March, somewhere at the end of February. So we collected the stools recently. Uh, so obviously albendazole works, uh, it's a favorite drug of mine because you can give it to someone and it does not cause any harm. Somebody will come with something and you really have, don't have any advice to give and people expect drugs even in rural areas and albendazole is a safe drug to give <laughs> and so it's a very good drug of mine, a very good drug to use. Uh, I, I even ha had an orthopedician senior in back 20 years back whose aim was to deworm the world, orthopedician, and he's got a lot of support now. So then let me make it very clear that albendazole is a very favorite drug. Uh, but the evidence on the ground uh, that we are seeing now is uh, that it's not very useful for the outcomes that we want to see, uh, whether there is weight gain, whether there is improvement in school. Uh, in fact, uh, if you want to look, actually look at worm wars, uh, you should read a few papers in International Journal of Epidemiology published in 2000. It's co come out this year, but it came online last year. Uh, and in that, uh, Juliet, Sinclair and Garner, they have published a review of the long-term studies. So they have looked at the Canaan studies uh, and they have looked at how they are actually not very good. Uh, this is apart from the systematic reviews that Cochrane and Campbell have published. They have looked at these specific studies, the Canaan studies, uh, as to what is wrong with them. And they talk about selective reporting, they talk about quality, etc., etc. And in the same journal, there are the original authors of the original study who have gone on saying that how the coconut reviews are not good, uh, why, they, why, why they are thinking of selective reporting, etc., etc. It's a very interesting read. You can actually imagine those people fighting with each other with swords. So it's very interesting to uh, read those articles. Uh, but the point is, uh, and I don't know if anyone has got mm -hmm. the idea, uh, uh, why was deworming kind of put forth and why it is getting criticized? Uh, one of the reasons that it is getting criticized is the quality of the studies. And uh, no one has brought it about, but I think the studies were carried out not by public health specialists, specialists, but they were actually from people from economics background. So not much of public health background. So the studies were of poor quality. Uh, and one of the things that they complain is the Cochrane Review and the, uh, 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 what do you say, Campbell Review applies rigid uh, ways of analyzing the data, uh, which is actually what they need to do. So the review is actually trying to do, trying to find out what is the correct thing. And you can't complain that you have a strict headmaster or a strict teacher. So that's one of the issues. Uh, another thing that is there uh, is if you look at how they tested for school outcomes, uh, one is they uh, looked at how long people remained in school. Uh, the review also points out, the one in IJ points out they remained longer in school because they failed, which is not a very good way of assessing outcome. So it's, it's very interesting. The one was a very interesting. It is, uh, another thing that they looked at is they test in Kenya, they tested for English. Now, I don't know what schools they are, but if English no, is not your native language, uh, how would testing in English tell you whether you are doing well in school? So there are these various ways of assessing outcomes. How we outcomes is also important. And that's n and, but after that came the DEVTA trial. The DEVTA trial got published in 2013, but as Dr. Sajdev mentioned it, it took almost seven to eight years for it to get published after getting completed, uh, which is actually because it was a negative trial, probably. But it tells you a lot of things that in India, a lot of children got tested and they did not show things like weight gain, height gain, so they were not there. Uh, so the point of contention is, uh, if people talk about long-term studies, 
if there is no immediate improvement in weight and height, which is a very good indicator for cognition later on in life. So, if you if you look at malnutrition, if you have your first three years of life or first five years of life well set with good weight and good height, you are very likely to get very good cognitive outcomes in your adulthood. You'll get you'll become taller, like Dr. White. You'll get good employment. You might become CEO of Campbell co Collaboration. But if you are shorter, uh, you are unlikely to achieve all those outcomes. And so, if the Devta trial tells you that there is not much weight gain, there is not much height gain or it is not very useful and there is definitely no difference in mortality, uh, you are very unlikely to get those long term outcomes. So, clinging on to long term outcomes based on Kenyan studies to say that we will wait for 8 years for you to show results is not a very good idea when your short term outcomes are not there. So, that is something very important that we need to remember. Uh, in June 2017, I think, I think it is just uh, last month. Uh, there is a long term impact study published out of China, I think 3IE funded a debombing study in China uh, and where also they also did not, it, it's also a very large study uh, and they also did not find uh, improvement in outcomes and they also blamed low prevalence. So, as uh, uh, Dr. Pratap said, uh, low prevalence is something which is going to be there. There are areas in the country where there is high prevalence where deworming will definitely improve the health of those kids who got dewormed. Uh, but is it right to deworm everyone if you want to improve the health of uh, a subset? Now, as a practitioner, what happens is when I am sitting in a clinic, people will come ki, uh, they, have, they want to give us uh, worm tablets. I have already given last month, should I take it again? Now, these are practical things that happens to people when you sit in clinics. And if I am a pediatrician, if you do not have a very outreach, you might, as, you might say that, okay, you can take it, nothing will happen. Or you might decide to say that uh, there is no need to take it. So, when you are implementing this thing on the ground, uh, this happens. This happened a lot with polio. Now, we are trying to say that we are basing our deworming uh, program on pulse polio and there is something that uh, I do not know if anyone knows, but when the pulse polio came first in 1995, I was told that in 5 years we will get rid of polio. Uh, it took at least 18 years uh, and so from an investment of 5 years to investment of 18 years, it is a lot of money. Uh, and we did that because pulse polio is based on, uh, supposed to have happened on 80 percent immunization coverage. There was 100 percent immunization coverage, yet we did not have it. And the immunization coverage was, was 100 percent because it was badly reported. So, when you talk of data, we do not really have accurate data. Uh, we are doing a study in uh, Dahod, which is a tribal area. Uh, people are born there with weights of 1, 1.5, 2, 2.5 only. There is no in-between weights. So, that is digit, digit preference. So, when people put data, they will put 1 kg, 1.5 kg, 2 kg and 2.5 kg. So, and we have data which shows that there is digit preference. So, the point is in if even if you have data, unless it is good data, it is of no use. Okay. Uh, you, even if you have good data and if you are not analyzing it, also it is of no use. So, there are things that we need to change. Uh, coming to uh, a few things, I think I will wrap up here, but I will wrap up with a few things. Uh, then two things, okay, but they are going to be the same anyway. Uh, one is uh, Paul Krugman is a Nobel Prize winning economist, again economist, in 1998 said that the internet is going to be as good as a fax machine. Uh, we know it, it is wrong, okay. The internet is very much more useful than a fax machine. And 2007, Steve Ballmer, the CEO of, uh, the founder of Microsoft uh, said that the iPhone is not going to be do anything. We know again it is wrong. So, the point is to make predictions. Uh, is quite difficult, but if you have evidence to make predictions, it is possible to make predictions. Uh, just uh, I, I forgot this, but uh, we also did a study on uh, latrines. So, since Swachh Bharat came about, uh, a lot of people started promoting it, people started sweeping floors, again photo ops came up, people sweeping, etc. Uh, but uh, it also did a good thing, it kind of funded a lot of latrines in the rural areas. So, around a hospital, we chose uh, four villages, villages. Uh, where there is funding for uh, latrines and we found that out of the, all the four villages, 25 percent people did not use toilets even if they were there. I could show you photographs of toilets stacked with grains, uh, toilets stacked with, uh, what do you say, tap in different direction and so on and so forth, but these things happen. Uh, in two villages which were certified ODF free, open defecation free on the government portal, almost about 60 households did not have any, uh, any toilets. Now, so, this is again data, uh, definitely there is improvement. Uh, what we found is depending upon the leadership in the villages, like leadership in the states, uh, wherever there was good leadership, there was good use, usage of uh, latrines. 
so uh, there is a focus on swachh bharat there is going to be an improvement in sanitation definitely uh, at least uh, from what i find from the present government it does implement things in in a pretty good way so we would expect definite some improvement in sanitation uh, if we want to deworm we have to probably decide much like pulse folio we will deworm only in those villages which are certified odf free or something like that some parameters where you can use we have, we have we have intersectoral coordination rather than uh, two people going that two different ways uh, we see that very much often in child health uh, there is a women and child health department and, and there is a health department they actually don't talk to get to, to each other even at the top even at the bottom you go to a village uh because we are doing studies in the villages in a single family there would be a anganwadi worker and a asha worker they don't talk to each other they, they do the things differently it's it's very funny but it's the real 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 deal thank you thank you, thank you very much uh, doctor before you leave write me a prescription for lemazol uh, <laughs> uh, because that for sure i am convinced works for me um but we, and you're right i mean there are these structural institutional failures which need to be fixed small intervention it's like the old saying of uh, rearranging the chairs on titanic i mean you don't have this coordination as you said at the very simple level then how are you going to do this so we need to think about that as well when it comes to policy making in the government but moving on to uh, uh, miss kalra you have actually put money in all this i mean you know if i were you sitting and listening to this uh, you know it, it's one thing to talk but another to put money behind the stuff why did you do it and how is it going sure um thank you so much sir and all the seniors for sharing the experiences i think uh the fact that soil transmitted helminths come under the neglected tropical disease no one was talking about the the whole the issue of worms as in when i started working in evidence action evidence action support the government in scale up of the national deworming day across the state and at the ministry level i didn't know about deworming as in i frankly 3 uh, years back no information about what can worms do to you worms can be inside you this big full of jars yeah full full jar full of worms and still you don't have like symptoms to show it's not a felt need to have or to take a tablet knowing that some of the figures uh, from the who is that india carries the highest burden around 62% of children less than 14 years are at risk so the the background of the foundation is that there the worms are there and you need to treat them and how do you treat them is through a simple tablet it's very uh, very safe to be taken we all have taken as and you can take it any time of the day uh, you take the tablet and you have lower worms so the prevalence and the intensity of worms both are important for the child for the uh, the child we don't talk about in public health uh, much about the quality of life right at the bottom level or below poverty line or children who are studying in private schools but in the nook and corners of the cities we don't talk about the quality they are living on a day to day basis so i think uh, with a simple solution to keep the worms low on a regular basis the tablet is uh, quite effective and uh, important and again to give you some uh, background in terms of the numbers there are 14 states uh, which are high prevalence in the country based on the uh, uh, ministry data the run by national center for disease uh, control around 19 states have moderate prevalence and two states have low prevalence but deworming at least once a year is required in all and except rajasthan and madhya pradesh it's required twice a year uh now coming to the national deworming day uh, the whole strategy as in india the population it's i think today is a world population day 11 july we have a huge population to even uh, think about in terms of scaling up or to roll out a program and in a country like our economies of scale is the concept as an economist talk about uh, administering the tablet we have data from at least our states from bihar madhya pradesh and rajasthan from 2015 that it cost only 4 rupee including everything including providing tablet training the the whole program uh, leverages the resources the available resources other than the tablet which is provided 
the teachers are already there uh, the monitoring system is already there it's only piggy banking on to the the available infrastructure in order to make sure that at least children who have worms get the tablet and because the tablet is so safe that it can be given to the other children also so from the overall uh, the uh, value addition point of view uh, i think not only in children who are in government schools but also in private schools uh, so the data shows that uh, in uh, the prevalence data in fact shows that it the prevalence in children studying in the private school is also equal or more higher than the the regular so it the the whole component of private school inclusion private school were never included in any of the government program uh, so under ndd uh, in 2016 uh, ministry decided to include at least 10% of the districts in one state and gradually now all as an almost all states have started scaling up the program in terms of the interest to reach out to this uh, this this target group and from a 1 lakh uh, schools in 2016 in recent uh, february 2017 around 2 lakh private schools took part in the initiative and also the out of school component which is a big challenge for the yeah yeah yes uh, yeah, i think uh, around 16 million children were like out of school were included in the programs to to mainstream them into the education system jo anganwadi mein bhi nahi hai and those are not in anganwadi not in school you have to at least reach out to them i think from a program perspective uh, these are very crucial and again so addressing to your uh, the question on uh, behavior change swachh bharat as in these are two routes one is the short term route and one is a long term route if you talk about behavior change if if i apply on myself it will take me two years to change my behavior right so in terms of making that change i think it's a combination of both short term route plus the long term route and this is what is addressed in the program also to be able to make sure that both goes in a holistic way and children are reached out uh, in the best possible way they can Thank you very much. Um, I take it you believe in this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But you know, we'll have to sort of uh, take a few questions, um, Dr. Sesseva. Uh, let me uh, set a few things right because I've been a part of Worm Wars and also uh, involved with the WHO. And you're not an economist. That's a very big yeah. thing. Yeah. yeah. So the first thing is that. the who guidelines on deworming were to update at the meeting has occurred they are to be updated they were supposed to be released in april but i understand they will be released the next or the next to next month so there may be surprises in what we know what we don't i would counter you and say you ask the question why doesn't it work i would say mass deworming works but it depends on what is the outcome that you are looking at yeah. both pratap and howard mentioned a whole lot of things but it somehow got subdued the egg count in both these reviews shows goes down it doesn't disappear it goes down to 20% so the only benefit of the mass deworming has shown is the egg count going down and third is what i come to what i was talking about perception or faith if you want to say here and here is the faith we are still living with even in this room that you go on giving mass deworming why doesn't it improve people are investing money on this so we are going living on the perception and faith despite this colossal evidence from two independent systematic reviews that there are no biological or functional benefits to the human of the kind which are being advertised <clears throat> only thing is egg count goes down let us be transparent about it let the ministry the politician the other stakeholders know it and after that is the country willing to invest this much sum and logistics that is the key question which we have to answer maybe the worms could yeah. regrow maybe it come the type of burden of the long worms as a clinician i can tell you which i was seeing as residents no longer exist it is gone 
that era is gone because of water supply, sanitation or something. So are we to invest the overall development route of water supply, sanitation or look at these quick fixes and distractions? That's the question the country has to ask. A question here and then at the back, yes. Worm wars or whatever, but it's in general even the way evidence is analyzed and uh, the hierarchy of evidence that goes into building for policy. Because we are all the time looking at RCTs at the higher end of hierarchies. And how can we expect RCTs to go on for years? So, invariably, RCTs are providing short term evidence. Okay, if you're looking at longitudinal evidence, where are all the zones where you expect worms? And they're all in the poor communities. So is it, are we looking at global evidence, regional evidence, local evidence? For me, that is an issue because we can't even say state-wise this is the highest, Sikkim is the highest or something else is lowest because I've been a clinician sitting in a posh South Delhi area and today I work in community resource poor community settings. I certainly did not see many worms when I was in practice, but today I know almost every house the child has worms. And I even discussed it at NIN with somebody very higher up. She said Delhi has never been a high zone for worms. But what is it I'm saying? So should we look at the urban resettlement colonies, the poor community settings for local evidence? And again, here you can't have a longitudinal study. There is a constant change. The immigration and all that is going to change the picture. So I suppose when governments are looking at long-term evidence, one has to look at not just the, you know, the geography, but even other patterns, which mm -hmm. perhaps is now easy to catch because of Aadhaar. I don't know. I'm not really supporting Aadhaar or anything here, but there needs to be a different kind of evidence apart from the hierarchy of evidence we are all used to as scientific researchers. Thank, Thank you. you. Good point. And I think Dr. Kera, I'm sure, is taking note. There's one last at the, at the end. Thank you, sir. You know, there was one. Let's have some equitable zonal distribution of <laughs> questions. Yeah. Uh, so uh, basically, I have some comments and some queries. The first comment is that it hardly depends how many children that we are taking into our study, whether it is 1 million or 35,000 or 65,000. It depends upon the methodology that we are taking care of. So when we talk about long-term study, so what, does the, what, does, what is the definition of a long-term study? So is it that you are providing intervention for two years and following up for another eight years or whether the long term study is that you are actually giving intervention for eight to ten years then you are following up. So when I read your Cochrane or maybe uh, Campbell collaboration review, they mentioned that they, the intervention, the highest uh, level of intervention was only for four years and then they followed up for uh, maybe say six to eight years. Then, but our recommendation says that you need to provide intervention for at least 8 to 10 years. And there are no studies, and there are no even RCTs, or there are no studies, longitudinal studies, that are saying that intervention, they have implemented an intervention for 8 to 10 years. The, the one comment. And the other query is that, are we taking into consideration the cost implications? Even Cochrane or Campbell does not talk about the, uh, the cost implications. What is the cost implications when you are targeting, when, when, when the children are being targeted? And the last point that I want to make here is that there are multiple worms that are affecting. Multiple worms affect multiple ways. So how we are taking into consideration, you know, round worms, whip worms, or maybe hook worms. There are, method, there are mathematical modeling saying that they are, there is a prevalence of hook worms in adults. They, they are now taking into a study that they are saying that there is no hookworm prevalence in the adults, in the children. So how we are consider, considering these facts into our studies? And the last point that, uh, just the last point that I want to make and maybe okay. in the query, the last point. Uh, maybe, sir, the last point. Yeah. So I just want to make that, you know. You said the same about the last one. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I just read my diary and there was another. But, point. you know, why don't you wait and we can have this Thank later because we need yeah. to. Okay, the last, last comment. The last, last, yeah. Okay. So, uh, albendazole, mabendazole. So, you have taken studies wherein you have taken uh, albendazole and other studies, mabendazole. So, how you have taken into efficacious uh, the point of view of um, these two drugs? Thank you. All right, thank you. I think uh, I will request the panelists because in the next session, which is the closing remarks, they are all there so they can answer and respond to these in the closing remarks. I will close this session. Uh, okay, a quick. I will start off with answering or maybe... Saying, saying a few things. Start then off. You have to 
finish. <laughs> Close <laughs> with answering something. Like, yeah. Uh, so yeah. uh, albendazole is much better than mebendazole. So that's 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 kind of established. And uh, when you do a review, you'll, you'll want to include. That's one of the things that Campbell did. They kind of include everything. And there are methodologies in which you can kind of uh, make sure that it is evenly distributed. I think they can talk more about it. Uh, but one thing I, I don't know anyone thought about this because I come from a area where there are a lot of cattle. Do you think cattle also have worms? Yeah, they also have worms. They also have hookworms, the same worms that we have. Uh, they have different worms mainly, but uh, what we have, they can also have, and what they have, we also can have. So not much, but that can happen. So anyone, nobody is talking about deworming cattle. I don't know, but that's we, we yeah. It's something which is I uh, know it does happen. That's another seminar. <laughs> <laughs> Deworming so, of cattle. Uh, Ankylostoma yeah. duodenal yeah. is around 10 percent. So uh, there is a study from Rajasthan. Rajasthan is a low prevalence area. There is a 10 percent uh, incidence of uh, Ankylostoma duodenal in around 436, 400 cattle that they check for. So Dr. that's something. Okay, we'll have to okay fine. Uh, the long term implications are not very valid because the short term implications show that they're not useful. So you cannot count on long time implications. That's I think what I already said once. And, yeah. All right, thank you very much. I think you know uh, all has been said. There's still to be response coming from this side. So it's not the end of the debate. It's just that the program says that I have to get out of here. That's the only difference that's going to make. The rest will remain the same. And before getting out, I must say that I do agree with this thing that when I was a young economist, there is a tremendous pressure to come up with counterintuitive stuff. I mean, it's intuition that this thing should work, but it will not get published if you say that deworming works. It will only get published if you say it doesn't work and you have to come up with something to, to publish. So one needs to think about it. Someone had made the comment about economist and that's, that's partly true. And I think finally we need to think of a policy organization, something like the Congressional, Congressional Budget Office in the US for every policy, it must come up with an estimate what it's going to cost, what would be its effect by an independent source. So all of us, uh, NDA, UPA, everybody can agree this is a neutral body. And it says so much would be the impact, so much would be the cost. And then perhaps we can have a debate. Otherwise, sitting here, the only operational thing I get is that I'm going to take that medicine right away. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, as a concluding, you know, what my kind of a take home message is, you know, public health decision making is a very, very a complex subject. And then the government, you know, doesn't, I mean, the changes the interventions or the policy as a knee-jerk reaction. And we have in the country, you know, a lot of systems in place. You may not have a confidence, you may continue to doubt the efficiency of the government, but I can tell you on behalf of the government that our systems are getting robust day by day. I'm not saying that we are perfect, but systems are getting better day by day. And we have a complete control on the kind of the data sets which are being generated. You know, you might get some examples here and there. People may keep quoting, but that is not complete India. So we have a complete handle on the data sets. And we continue to use data sets for our program monitoring, for program management, and even at the appropriate point of time, even for policy changes, so data are appropriately used. And beside that, we also continue to have independent evaluations. And I think studies like, you know, meta-analysis of Cochrane or Campbell, they are really very helpful in our decision making. But one Campbell study or one, you know, kind of a Cochrane study, you know, we can't take a decision. It has to be a very, very holistic fashion. Like I remember I was recently in one of the meetings in, on neglected tropical disease, now, Sri Lanka has now stopped giving deworming. I said, why they have stopped? They have stopped because their end point has reached. Their prevalence has gone less than 1%. Now, in India now, we have a prevalence of, let's say, 40%, 50%. So, we're also looking for an end point. Now, then another in the point which I wanted to react was, in terms of, you know, measuring the outcome. Now, outcome is cannot be measured by just one intervention. I mean, it has a multiple factors are operating. So I think it is very difficult to make a judgment that just by deworming the weight gain has not improved because weight gain depends on other things also. And then that's why under the program we have an end point that is the worms. We want country, we want children to be free of worms. And if today I have a prevalence of 
or 40 percent i am targeting to make it less than five percent so that's the way you know we look at it thank you yeah no further comments i think thank you for organizing this no uh, worm wars only i think we already have so many <laughs> wars going around so i think uh, as a program uh, it is continuously like looking at now to improve the uh, implementation so that we are able to reach the end point very soon i think that is what the objective is and a worm free world is what we are working towards say one statement i just want everyone to know that i read so much about smoking that i stopped reading that shouldn't happen uh first of all i'd like to thank dr kera i'm i'm absolutely delighted that you were here and we discussed this and i'm really grateful to you that you actually uh you know read the cochrane review i i was such a you know i opened for me that you have somebody in the ministry who reads cochrane reviews and i think uh, i agree with you i think that uh, we should be looking for uh, working towards a worm free world in terms of our children and stuff and i think that you're on the right track because we are uh, looking at trying to upscale so you can actually reduce the prevalence of worm infection and we are also simultaneously trying to improve water sanitation and no doubt in some time it'll happen all that the cochrane review did was tell us let us be clear about what we're trying to do that's all and i think it did work because it woke everybody up so i feel that this whole process of trying to question established beliefs it needs to happen on an ongoing basis and i'm glad that you are a person who actually thinks and are willing to take it and not react in a knee jerk manner i certainly don't believe you should stop deworming because of the cochrane review i don't believe that because i think we have to think but i know that we will not get those outcomes you are looking for that's all we are trying to say those purported outcomes are not going to happen doesn't matter we still need to get rid of worms i have no problem because it shows overall our sanitation will improve only then will you get rid of worms deworming is only one of the strategies thank you very much and i'd like to explain to everybody that the government of india is spending more than a crore of rupees every year to ensure that evidence in the form of systematic reviews are made available to all its citizens so you can think of what we could do with that money uh if nobody is going to read all this there could be so many other things i'm not trying to make you feel guilty but i'm saying if you're here to look at evidence matters that's one source of evidence and campbell has other sources of evidence i think it's our duty to look at the evidence and uh i also suggest that everybody who has not read the cochrane and campbell reviews they're available free online and they have included long term studies they have included observational studies they have looked at uh, intensity of infection all kinds of things it's really worthwhile reading these reviews thank you very much okay